Yeah. Uh, hi, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Dr. Nikhil. So today's... Uh, sorry. Yeah, today's topic is early nutrition in uh, preterm neonates. So we'll just uh, start off. So with introduction, there are 15% to 20% of all births uh, worldwide are of low birth weight or uh, premature, representing more than 20 million births a year with more than 96% in the low and middle income countries. In India, the main cause of neonatal death as uh, recorded in 2015 was prematurity, followed by birth asphyxia and uh, birth trauma, followed by sepsis. So as you can see, the prematurity and its uh, related causes was one of the uh, main causes of death in uh, India. This is the situation which is similar in uh, most of the developing world and low and middle income countries. Uh, so now, as we know, because of the technological advances that have occurred in the field of uh, neonatal studies and the NICU, uh, it has resulted in an increased survival and of an increasing number of premature and very low uh, birth weight infants. The earliest that has survived in Japan has been around 400 gram, that is around 22 weeks, and that went home uh, recently at around 38 weeks of gestation, uh, requiring home oxygen. And as of now, the baby is uh, good, according to uh, what the news reports have come in. So this shows us that because of the technological advances, the uh, babies are surviving, but we need to give the babies a very good uh, head start in life, as well as we need to make sure that neurodevelopmentally they are normal. So this is the... Uh, uh, future that we are looking at, at as to improve the uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes rather than just survival of the prematures. So these infants require specialized nutritional support because of a high degree of biochemical immaturity, uh, faster growth rates and increased demands resulting from increased risk of respiratory problems that is apnea, sepsis, etc. So uh, we know that nutrition is important. Let us consider why this proper nutrition. So there are terminologies such as aggressive nutrition, proper nutrition, and as to the uh, proper way in which the nutrition has to be started and continued in a premature. So why proper nutrition is important in preterm neonates? Nutrition is essential for growth, metabolism, and immunity in a preterm or a low birth weight infant. In a preterm infant, poor nutrition is associated with a poorer head growth. Persistent smaller head size results in poor psychomotor and mental skills and higher rates of cerebral palsy and autism. Uh, so this has been proven in multiple studies. Uh, just coming back to what are the definitions of a low birth weight infants in an Indian scenario is less than uh, 2,500 grams or 2.5 kgs. Uh, very low birth weight will be a less than 1500 grams and extremely low birth weight will be uh, less than 1000 grams. These uh, terminologies are important as we move ahead with the slides. Impaired weight and growth in preterm infants are significantly associated with adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes in later life. Baker's hypothesis also states that infants with low birth weight are at a higher risk of coronary heart disease, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes in adulthood. Sorry. Uh, nutrition is an important factor influencing the developmental outcomes in uh, premature babies. It has been noted that better nutrition in the early postnatal phases in preterm infants results in a higher uh, verbal intelli intelligence quotient or IQ scores and improved cognitive function in the long term. Higher protein and energy intake during the first week after birth in uh, ELBWs is associated with a higher mental developmental index scores and lower risk of growth retardation at 18 months after birth. Early and higher protein and energy intake have also been correlated with faster head growth and an increase in the head circumference in the preterm infants. Just uh, coming back to the history of uh, the modern infant uh, preterm care, 
It has its origin in the Hospital de la Charité in Paris. Pierre Budin, uh, influenced by the former head midwife of the maternity, uh, Madam Henry, installed the first specialized care unit for weaklings as underweight newer infants were then referred to in 1893. But it took up to 1983 for one of the first articles to appear in the Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism, which was somehow related to nutrition and uh, neonates. And they investigated the effect of iron supplementation during pregnancy. Uh, this study was uh, uh, would not have been possible today because it was a double-blind uh, study as well as when one uh, uh, group of pregnant ladies were not given iron supplementation and when one group were given iron supplementation. So this can't be done in uh, today's day and age. So now coming to the actual uh, topic, uh, starting feeds pro for the prematures. So we have all heard of uh, how to start for the feeds, what to start for the feeds and what nutrition has to be started when it has to be started. So initially we always start off with what we call as a trophic feeds. So trophic feeds is nothing but around 10 to 20 ml per kg uh, body weight of the milk that we start. And the milk that we start is always uh, breast milk. It can either be an express breast milk or a donor pasteurized breast milk. So what is the objective of the trophic feeds? It is not systemic nutrition. So starting of the trophic feeds is not about giving the nutrition for the baby, but it is to begin development the uh, begin to developing the gut for later and for uh, priming the gut for more rapid increases in feeding. Such early feeding may promote intestinal villus development, enzymatic activation to enhance digestion and absorption, and development of a gut microbiome that prevents infection and NEC, and reduces local and systemic inflammation. So as we can see, gut priming is the most important part of our trophic feeds, and what we start as trophic feeds, and when we start. So the sooner that we start the trophic feeds is much better. In our unit, we always plan to start the trophic feed soon after birth, that is within a few hours. If the baby is very, very premature and uh, having any IUGR or any related uh, uh, illnesses, then uh, and only then that we delay the uh, starting of uh, trophic feeds for a few hours. Otherwise, soon after birth, that is starting. Uh, early trophic feed starting is uh, by definition less than 48 hours, so less than two days and late will be more than 72 hours or after three days. So what is better, enteral or parenteral nutrition? Always and always enteral nutrition is uh, the safest and it is always much better. Uh, enteral nutrition is preferred to parenteral nutrition as the latter may be associated with cath catheter -rel uh, related complications, infections and sepsis. So, uh, enteral nutrition is always much better, as we can see. So, the one of the main reasons for not starting enteral nutrition, especially a, uh, when we look at the older studies, is that uh, it was thought that enteral nutrition starting in a premature baby might lead to an increased risk of NEC. But according to studies published after 1990, so 1990 is sort of a, a watershed mark. When the studies published after 1990, there has been no increase in the risk of NEC with fast or early enteral feeding, uh, enteral feeding of express breast milk as compared to slow or delayed introduction of enteral feeding in low birth weight infants. Uh, furthermore, enteral feeding has been found to aid in the development of the gut and lower the risk of infections and sepsis. Why? This we will come to later. So early versus late starting of enteral uh, feeds, uh, as I have already said, early starting of enteral feeds is always much better. And uh, like we thought before that uh, late starting of enteral feeds might reduce the risk of NEC, but this is not the case. On the contrary, this approach may prolong the time to achieve full feeding. Early versus late, that is less than 48 hours to more than 72 hours after feeding initiation, of enteral feeding has been associated with a significantly lesser time to gain birth weight and a shorter duration of parenteral uh, nutrition and hospital stay, 
without any in increase in the complication rate. So this is the most important part that we don't find any complication, increase in the complication rate as when we start off with the uh, enteral feeding early. A reduced incidence of osteopenia of prematurity and jaundice has also been noted with early versus late enteral feeding in very low birth weight infants. Rapid versus slow advancement of enteral feeds. So several studies have assessed the outcomes of rapid versus slow. Uh, what do we mean by rapid? Rapid is basically just going up on the enteral feeds once we have started with the trophic feeds. So classically, we always try to increase the feeds by 10 to 20 ml per kg uh, per day uh, uh, for the neonates. And uh, whether we can increase it at 10 to 20 or 10 to 30, it depends on the unit to unit, there is a differentiation. But what the studies have shown that whether we increase it slowly, whether we increase it fast, it doesn't have much of a, a difference in the outcome. But rather, if we are increasing it rapidly, then the time for achieving full enteral feeds obviously goes down and the chances of infection, chances of any other complication also goes down. In a study conducted in neonates with birth weight less than uh, 1250 grams, rapid versus slow advancement of enteral feeds was associated with a significantly lesser time required to achieve full feeding and to regain the birth weight, shorter duration of hospital stay, comparable feed tolerance, and no increase in the risk of NEC. So in one of the studies, Salotra A et al, PBM was... Uh, used for increasing the uh, for advancement of the enteral feeds and nowadays uh, because formula feeds are have also come in which are almost similar to the uh, in composition to the breast milk so the modern the important thing to note here is that the modern formula feeds have been used uh, in other studies like morgan j et al and they have also reported similar findings so coming to the next part, which is continuous versus the bolus feeding in uh, this, we always look at in very low birth weight babies, that is less than 1500 or less than 1000 grams also. So according to Shahiro's Premji et al in a Cochrane review, they did not find any difference between bolus or continuous feeding to achieve full feeds or apneic episodes or risk of NEC. So these were some of the parameters which were uh, studied, that is apneic episodes, NEC and uh, time to achieve the full feeds. What is continuous feeding and what is bolus feeding? Continuous feeding is where so you put a orogastric or a nasogastric tube and continuous feeding is given at a fixed rate. And bolus feeding can be hourly, two hourly, three hourly, depending on the unit. In our unit, we typically start off with a two hourly feeds. And if it is not tolerating, then we go up to an hourly feed. So in uh, bolus feeding, we see that, uh, I mean, we give a certain amount at specific times. Theoretical risks and benefit of both continuous and intermittent bolus uh, milk feeding have been proposed. Continuous feeding may improve the energy efficiency because the baby doesn't have to expend any energy by increasing the energy absorbed and decreasing the energy expenditure. Reduce the feeding intolerance, improve the nutrient absorption and improve the growth. So this can be some of the theoretical benefits. However, continuous infusion of milk into the GIT could alter the cyclical pattern of release of GI tract hormones, which might affect the metabolic homeostasis and growth. Our gut has been primed to accept bolus intermittent feeding. Uh, so this is much more physiological, uh, is the theoretical benefit that uh, we uh, see. Uh, secondly, but in uh, very low birth weight or extremely low birth weight uh, babies less than 1000 grams or very low preterm, like more than less than 28 or 29 weeks, it has been seen that both continuous as well as bolus feeding has been given and uh, the theoretical benefit or the uh, outcomes have been almost similar. Properly functioning lower esophageal sphincter is an important barrier against the reflux. Reflux and aspiration may be compounded receiving uh, in the infant receiving the continuous nasogastric feedings. 
so how to feed enterally so this is another thing with whether it is ngt or ogt ogt is much more preferred because the dose is very small passage of nasogastric tube has been noted to increase the airway resistance in preterm infants by 30 to 50% increased incidence of periodic breathing and central apnea has also been noted in some of the studies so can we give the feeding during ventilation or cpap of course yes assisted ventilation does not increase the risk of ge reflux and therefore is not a contraindication although nasal cpap therapy results in a gaseous bowel distension or the cpap belly syndrome in majority of vlbw babies this may not be attributed to nec the feeding method has no correlation with the occurrence of the cpap belly uh, syndrome so we always continue with the feeding whether irrespective of whether the baby is on cpap or on ventilator and coming to what milk has to be given so always always we start off with breast milk as i have mentioned before also breast milk should be the milk of choice for providing nutrition to preterm lbw infants due to its several inherent advantages so overall benefits better feeding tolerance by a lower risk of nec sepsis and late onset sepsis reduce length of hospital stay and risk of rehospitalization microvascular outcomes can include protective role in preventing ropes neurological outcome improved neurological development in later years significant higher iq in later years and better receptive language at 3 years and verbal and non verbal iq at 7 years uh bone health significant increase in the whole body bone area and bone mineral content so the first choice of human milk for feeding preterm infants is express breast milk from the mother and the second choice is donor pasteurized human milk so donor pasteurized human milk is the term used for what we call as a donor milk pasteurizer should be used for pasteurization of uh, human milk and pasteurized milk should not be used so donor pasteurized human milk should be screened for hiv hepatitis c virus hepatitis b antigen venereal disease and bacteria using relevant tests or cultures we have multiple donor milk banks which are situated in bangalore so uh, but we are using what we call as a uh, from a company called as neolacta uh, we in our unit we have not found any uh, increased sepsis with after we have started using neolact so this is why we continue to use that this is a donor pasteurized milk that we use so according to espergan what are the required nu nutrient intakes for preterm infants uh, fluid 135 to 200 ml per kg per day energy is 110 to 135 protein 3.5 to 4.5 fat will be 4.4 to 5 or 4 to 6 and so on uh, the reason for putting this slide up is that what we need to understand is though breast milk or express milk is the nutrient of choice the milk of choice for uh, preterm infants but because of the prematurity the preterm milk doesn't contain much of uh, energy protein or fat and uh, that's why uh, some sort of a fortifier will be required going ahead once the baby is tolerating a certain amount of uh, milk then we start to add some uh, fortifiers so fortification can be multi component or mono component in india currently we only have multi component uh, uh, breast milk fort uh, multi component fortifier sorry and bovine or breast milk so bovine is something which is very very commonly found and uh, which we use regularly breast milk uh, fortifier by which is uh, through donor breast milk is also available now with the same company with neolacta we have in our unit we have used it on a couple of babies and it has been tolerated well uh so when do we fortify so why do we fortify may not meet the recommended nutritional needs uh, with the standard volumes that is about 150 to 180 of breast milk and it does not provide the recommended amount of energy or protein so that's why multi nutrient fortifier is used initially there were also some uh, liquid fortifiers which were there but 
we don't use that we use only powdered form uh feeding the preterm infants with human milk fortified with energy and protein as well as minerals and other nutrients may be expected to promote nutrition nutrient accretion and growth that is increase in the height weight uh and uh, head circumference higher levels of nutrient intake during this critical period may be especially important for infants who are not able to consume larger larger quantities of milk who have slow growth or who have additional ongoing nutritional and metabolic requirements so typically we can increase the total volume up to around 200 to 220 ml per kg in uh, preterm infants but if that is not tolerated well the other uh, way to go about it is once we reach around 100 to 120 ml per kg we can start adding the human milk fortifier but in our unit what we have found is uh, we always try to go up to at least 150 ml per kg once that is tolerated well then slowly we start adding the fortifiers so human milk fortifiers what we use currently initially we add one one uh, packet to 50 ml of uh, the milk we always only use it only for donor or uh, express breast milk not for formulas so once that is tolerated then one packet in 25 ml and that we continue potential disadvantage of multi nutrient fortification is that increasing the nutritional density and osmolarity of breast milk might interfere with gastric emptying and intestinal peristalsis but that is not very very common so although available trial data show that multi nutrient fortification increases the growth rate of preterm infants during their initial hospital admission they do not provide consistent evidence on effects of longer term growth or development some of the studies have been done uh, with cochrane database of systemic reviews also which have seen that only the in hospital studies have shown uh, i mean the studies which are done for in hospital patients they have only shown uh, appreciable increases in the head circumference or length but longer term studies have not shown any variation whether the fortifiers were used or not so this is still a gray area as to how beneficial it is in the longer uh, term but some of the studies which which cochrane this same study has also shown that the uh, interest uh, iq levels of the uh babies at around 18 months of age have also been studied some uh, studies have shown that there can be an increase very minute increase when the fortifiers have been used so hmf may be used only when the infant reaches a feed of 100 ml per kg per day so this is true for the bovine uh, human milk fortifiers but the fortifiers which are from the uh, donor milk that can be started to use much early like 50 ml or 60 ml per kg also in clinical practice like we said uh, ideally around 25 ml of uh, uh, milk for 1 1 gram of hmf packet this we can uh, say safely say that it increases the protein content by around 1 gram per 100 ml so what is parenteral nutrition so basically why should it be used for most preterm infants it should be considered as a short term bridge to provide nutritional support till full enteral uh, feeding uh, enteral nutrition can be provided so such instances include immediately after birth to provide essential nutrition as enteral feedings are just commenced and starting to be advanced during periods of uh, acute gi malfunction that is uh, sometimes due to septic ileus or nec or when infants are infants are felt too sick to receive enteral feeds ex example during treatment with high dose presses or uh, during ecmo so what is early and uh, lay full parenteral nutrition in early parenteral nutrition it is intended to be started as soon as possible after the infant's birth usually within a few hours after delivery primary goal is to prevent excessive catabolism by providing energy and protein uh, what is a full parenteral nutrition intended to meet the entire nutritional needs of the infant and support normal rates of growth to do so it must contain a wide range of essential nutrients and sufficient protein and energy to support the growth uh, so what we give uh, is macro and micronutrients in macronutrients it uh, consists of amino acid lipids carbohydrates uh, uh, with regards to glucose micronutrients will contain calcium 
uh, sodium other uh, and others so just coming to the amino acid that is early initiation of uh, parental nutrition including amino acid for preterm infants is associated with improved short term growth outcomes such as the time to regain the birth weight and medium term uh, growth outcomes such as discharge weight or length below the 10th centile for age compared with uh, later initiation of uh, parental nutrition so ideally we always start off with uh, the at least the amino acid uh, soon after birth and uh, it is started at directly at 3 to 3 grams per kg per day slowly we can go up to 3.5 to 4.5 gram depending on the gestational age of the baby the lower the gestational age the higher the protein requirement there is no evidence that lower starting doses are necessary or that they are beneficial most consistent outcomes of studies performed to increase the protein and amino acid nutrition is that there is a direct positive increase in nitrogen and protein balance as intake increases from 0 to 4 gram per kg per day principal effects uh, of earlier or higher rates include increased weight gain increased weight at discharge and reduced growth restriction at term gestation that is the eugr so decreased uh, uh, incidence of eugr uh, lipids so nowadays we uh, have uh, changed to using smoff lipid instead of intra lipids because intra lipids have been shown to increase the liver toxicity smoff lipid is uh, much safer so this is what we are using in our unit also uh, lipids are an important component of parental nutrition they are an important source of energy so non protein uh, no sorry yeah non protein uh, sources of energy that is around uh, 30 to 40% which is required so lipids constitute a major part of that the other is of course uh, with the carbohydrates they are also needed to prevent essential fatty acid deficiency which can occur within the first week of life and as early as the second day so lipids also we start off within the first 24 hours of life this we start initially at around 1 gram per kg per day and go up to around 3 grams per kg per day <clears throat> so coming to the next part of uh, the talk that is what is known as a preterm and iugr as we know in india iugr is very very common because of multiple uh, maternal as well as genetic or epigenetic factors so we have a double whammy of preterm as well as iugr so iugr is typically uh, defined as the growth rates intrauterine growth rates less than the 10th centile for the expected gestational age so if the baby is born both preterm as well as iugr it is a double whammy for the baby so the nutrition also takes a hit and what type of nutrition that we can give for such babies is uh, what we will see why iugr is again important is that many times there are doppler changes to the baby also uh, which can include some absent or uh, absent and diastolic uh, flow uh, excuse me so when the absent and diastolic flow happens so there is a decreased uh, blood flow to the intestine and uh, this can uh, increase the chances of feed intolerance so the growth restricted premature infants pose a significant nutritional challenge for the reasons uh, just said enteral feeding though is the safest from an infection perspective but immature gut physiology puts these babies at a higher risk of developing nec so abnormalities of splanchnic blood flow persists during the first week of life providing physiological justification for a delayed and careful introduction uh, of enteral feeding but such an approach predisposes premature iugr babies to the risks associated with parental nutrition with no trials to date showing any benefit so even though there can be uh, some uh, theoretical risks for uh, starting and increasing the enteral feed but studies have not shown that so typically what we do for such babies is concurrent starting of uh, parental nutrition as well as at least the trophic feeds and we go a little slowly when we are increasing the feeds currently preferential use of human breast milk uh, uh, as usual and early commencement of uh, the uh, minimal enteral feeds 
and standardized feeding protocols with cautious advancement of feeds are practiced in most centers uh, to facilitate the gastrointestinal adaptation, improve the feed tolerance, and reduce the risk of NEC. There have been multiple studies, but none greater than the ADAPT trial, which was undertaken in the UK. So this has uh, conclusively shown that uh, internal feeding is the best. But uh, for less than 29 weeks uh, gestational age, slow advancement of uh, feeds uh, is much better, is what they have found in the, that trial. So this is the uh, largest number of uh, neonates which were uh, uh, enrolled for a study in the UK and uh, with IUGR uh, babies. So coming to the next part, what is an EUGR? That is the extrauterine growth retardation. Previously, we saw the intrauterine. So it refers to the postnatal nutritional insufficiency causing the lack of growth pattern manifested by growth parameters below certain reference uh, levels. EUGR has been reported to affect around 40 to 95% of premature infants. It is defined by a weight, length, or head circumference value that falls below the 10 centile of the expected IUG uh, intrauterine growth at 36 to 40 weeks uh, or at discharge. More recently, a longitudinal definition based on more than one SD reduction in weight Z score between birth and discharge has been more frequently used. So this is a longitudinal and that is just at a static. In VLBW infants have been proposed uh, an aggressive nutrition. So in aggressive nutrition, what we mean by that is early initiation of uh, parental nutrition, full parental nutrition, as well as starting off with the enteral nutrition to achieve a growth rate as close uh, as possible to that of a fetus of the same gestational age. So what are the most common reasons of EUGR? There can be periods of inadequate nutrition in the prematures for reasons just described. There can be feed intolerance, including NEC, range of mild to severe morbidities associated with preterm birth, uh, duration of initial weight loss in the neonatal period. So we can accept around 10 to 10 percent of weight loss, but we always need to uh, uh, assume that the birth weight will be reached as soon as possible. Infants who require longer time to time to regain birth weight are more likely to develop EUGR and impaired growth as they grow older. And of course, geno genomic imprinting and epigenetic factors. Uh, so coming to the summary of the talk, enteral feeding is safe and may be preferred to parental nutrition due to complications associated with the latter. However, parental nutrition may be a useful adjunct to enteral feeding in some critical cases. Early, fast or continuous enteral feeding yields better outcomes compared to uh, late, slow or intermittent feeding respectively. Routine use of NGT is not advisable. Preterm infants can be fed while on ventilator or on uh, CPAP. Routine evaluation of gastric residuals and abdominal girth should be avoided. Uh, there is no use for it. Express breast milk is the first choice for feeding preterm infants due to its beneficial effects on cardiovascular, neurological, bone health, and growth outcomes. Second choice is DBM. EBM or donor milk may be fortified uh, without increasing the osmolarity of the milk. Use of targeted and adjustable fortification where possible helps provide optimal nutrition. Optimizing weight gain in preterm infants prevents the long-term cardiovascular complications. Standard fortification is effective and safe, but does not fulfill the may not fulfill the high protein needs. Use of targeted and adjustable fortification where possible helps provide optimal nutrition. Optimizing the weight gain in preterm infants prevents long-term cardiovascular complications. Early introduction and rapid achievement of full enteral feeding remain a priority in the nutrition management of preterm infants as it reduces the need for parental nutrition with its associated risk of infection and increased risk of hospital stay, increased the length of hospital stay. However, need to attain enteral feeds rapidly is often difficult due to the physiological immaturity of the gut and compromised gut perfusion in IOGR uh, neonates. Always and always, ideal goal, though not always achievable, is to prevent the EUGR. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thanks, Nikhil. Wonderful talk. Uh, any questions from everybody?
It was so crystal clear, huh, Nikhil? <laughs> I have a, just a, a question about your practice here. Yes, madam. Yeah. So basically, uh, when uh, you are, you know, what, what, what's your strategy for uh, mothers who actually are not able to produce enough breast milk in the beginning? And do you supplement with PN sometimes when there is, and uh, like how many babies don't tolerate enteral feed? What's your practice? What's your observation so far? Most of the, so initially in our unit, we always start off with uh, either EBM or DBM. So we are okay. very, very clear with all the attenders stating that uh, some sort of breast milk is essential. We have uh, never started the babies initially on any formulas. Formulas are only used once the baby has tolerated feeds and just before discharge. So till then, uh, even though there is a higher cost in what, but because we have seen that lower risk and lower complications happen. So that's why we use donor milk if the EBM is not available. We encourage the mothers to come and express here or uh, we show uh, when the nurses help the mothers out to express, try and express uh, at home also. If that is not possible, then always we uh, use donor milk. Protocol here always has been that for extreme uh, preterms or less than around 32 weeks, uh, we always try to reach full feeds, which we define as 150 ml per kg with some sort of a breast milk. And after that, we start the fortification if uh, possible. Otherwise, we can go directly to even uh, formula feeds once the gestation is around 34 weeks uh, gestation. So that is the uh, thing that we are following here. And parenteral nutrition, we always start off with at least the amino acids uh, for less than 32 weeks because we have seen that uh, the, I mean, growth retardation is much more uh, unlikely if we are concurrently using parenteral as well as enteral feeds. So till the babies reach around 100, 120, always we continue with the parenteral nutrition as much as possible. Wonderful. Any other questions so, from anyone else? Okay. Wonderful. We'll close the session then. Thanks a lot, Nikhil. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Yes, madam.